This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the hosting provider I use for devchat.tv. I also use it for my applications that manage the RSS feeds, scheduling, and sponsorships involved in delivering these shows. DigitalOcean is easy to use, has data centers all over the world, and provides terrific services including server hosting and object storage for delivering your web applications and assets quickly and easily. I use DigitalOcean because I love their interface. I get SSD storage for my servers, and their support replies quickly. So go check them out at DigitalOcean.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Elixir Mix. This week on our panel, we have Eric Berry. Hey! Josh Adams. Hello. Mark Erickson. Hey there. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. I just want to quickly apologize for not being around the last couple of weeks. I was at a couple of conferences, and uh, my dad passed away a couple of weeks ago. So it's just kind of been this whirlwind of I'm not doing anything for anyone for anything. So anyway, I apologize for not being around, but I'm back. We have a special guest, and that's Sam Davies. Sam, do you want to say hello? Oh, hey, guys. How's it going? Yeah, we brought you on today to talk about asynchronicity. But before we do that, why don't we just have you do a quick introduction, let people know who you are, all that stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm Sam Davies. You can find me on Twitter, uh, at Sam Philip D. Uh, I have a blog as well, SamuelDavies.net. Um, so I've been programming for about six years. I started off uh, in Ruby, um, got into Elixir about a year ago because the company I was working for before had some um, scalability problems with Ruby, and I was sort of looking for solutions to that and alternatives. I stumbled across Elixir and sort of really liked what I was seeing. Um, so I got quite involved in that, um, made some contributions to Elixir early on, and um, basically joined the company I'm currently working at now, which is Nested, um, about a year ago, and sort of introduced Elixir here. So that's where I'm currently working. You know, I see on your uh, profile something about Pro Golf Me. And yeah, that was a startup I had before. Um, so before I started working at Nested, actually, I worked on the startup for about a year. It's, Pro Golf Me was an app. So the idea is, as a, as a golfer, if you want to, um, you don't always have access to a qualified coach or a qualified coach might be too expensive for you. So you can download the app and you can scroll through a list of coaches, um, find one that you like, and then take a video of your golf swing and then essentially get um, online lessons. So they'll send you back a video telling you tips and tricks for you to improve your golf game. Dang. This is already worth it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So I see that you're also um, a contributor to the Rails core and to the Elixir core. At what point in time did you move from uh, Rails over to Elixir? I'm, I'm actually, we, we literally just finished recording an episode of Ruby Rogues, Chuck and I did. And oh, yeah. we had this great big long conversation about like, when is Ruby the right way to go? And, you know, uh, in a panel full of Rubyists, it's, it, you're going to get a different answer than a panel full of ex-Rubyists or people who have migrated. I think every single one of us have started off, at least we, we, we did work for a while in Ruby before uh, starting in Elixir. So tell us yeah. about your experience Eric, in that. Eric was being mean and begging on my radio. <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I was the only voice of reason. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, listen, man, uh, like Ruby was sort of my first love when it came to programming. Like I, I, I started out, I wrote a bit of like, I wrote all sorts actually. I've done uh, a lot of different languages and Ruby always had a sort of a, a magic for me. Like it's very, it's very beginner friendly. I think the community is really great. Like the community is really one of its strengths, you know, Matt's sort of philosophy of just be nice to everyone kind of thing and being very welcoming to beginners. Um, that's what really got me into programming. And I think the cool thing about Elixir is that it takes a lot of those things that Ruby did really great, like the really great community, the very accessible syntax, the fact that it's about programmer happiness, sort of took those things and put them on top of like a really solid foundation, which is the Erlang virtual machine. So I, I wrote an article about this on my blog very recently called Why Elixir, which sort of explains a bit about, about this and sort of came to the conclusion that Elixir is one of those unicorn languages that doesn't seem to have any trade-offs. Like if you go, you can say, okay, so we need performance, so we're going to write something in um, uh, Java or something, or you know, we want it to be easily, we want it to iterate quickly, so I'll write it in Ruby. Well, in Elixir, you can actually have both of those things and a really great community as well. Um, so that's kind of really what sold it for me. Yeah, so I agree with that entirely, except for math libraries. 
but yes. yeah, that's, that's one thing it lacks. And obviously, like um, a front end as well. I, I mean, there, there is a thing called Elixir script, but I'm not sure if it's production ready or if I if I think Elixir is particularly suited to that. Yeah, we had Brian Joseph on here uh, recently. Mm, okay, cool. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and dig in on this idea of asynchronous programming. Sure. So what this came out of was a problem we were having at work. So to understand this, you sort of have to understand a little bit of a history about the Beam. Um, the Beam is the Erlang virtual machine. I'm sure you guys all know that. But so when uh, the Beam was originally developed, it was designed to run for a really long time without being rebooted. So you'd sort of have your, like, um, your, your telephone exchange or whatever, um, and you'd have it in like a box in the woods somewhere, and um, it'd be, you'd have redundant hardware in it, and you'd send out an engineer you know, every six months or every year to upgrade the thing. Um, and the upgrade he would run would, would be using hot code reloading, which the Erlang virtual machine provides you with. So you'd go out there, and you'd have, you'd have tested the software upgrade extensively beforehand. You'd go out, you'd upgrade your thing, um, the hot code reloading, a lot of OTP is actually about hot code reloading. If you ever look at the source code in Erlang for the application and stuff like that, like most of it is about making hot code reloading work properly. And it's really clever because you can have state in a process and you can load new code into the beam and have your process execute new code and, main, and keep the same state that you had before. So you can have processes in state that live a really long time, even as you're upgrading the code. So the whole... One of the assumptions that the, that the beam made was that um, your processes would hang around for a long time. You'd have state hanging around for a long time. Um, however, this is actually not a valid assumption for how people are deploying Elixir applications today. Most, almost all Elixir deployments actually today don't work like this. So uh, at my local meetup, I made this talk and I said, okay, put up your hand if you're actually using hot code reloading in production. One guy put up his hand out of a room of like 60 people. He was like, oh, yeah, I used it on my last job like two years ago. And, like every, and everyone else is deploying in a different way. So the way that I imagine it, I describe it, when you have hot code reloading, it's like, okay, you've got your house and you want to make a modification to your house. So you, build like an ext- you, want to, you want to build a new room, so you build an extension. And while you're building the extension, everyone can still live in the house. They're all fine. They can keep doing their thing. But the way we deploy now is, let's say you're, you, know, you might be using Docker or something like that. You just tear down the old Docker container and spin up your new one. And it's kind of like when you upgrade your house, you just destroy your house and get a whole new house. And obviously, like, you know, what happens to all the, all the people in the house? Well, it's, it's not a good day for them. And that's what happens to your processes. So you, can't, you can no longer make this assumption that some state you have in memory or some process you're running is going to be around for a long time because every time you deploy, it gets whacked and you lose everything. So now you come to this problem of, well, you have something you want to do asynchronously. And the classic example would be like a sign-up flow. So someone wants to sign up to the website and you want to do some actions based on that. So let's say you want to, you know, you want to send them an email to say, welcome to the website. You want to put the customer in your CRM. Uh, you, you can do a few things like that, but you don't want to keep the user hanging around with this, watching the spinner while you're doing all that stuff. So you kick it off into the background process and you say, okay, we'll do that stuff sometime later. We'll return to the user now and let them carry on. Um, Sometimes those jobs can take quite a long time or they can be delayed because you've got a backlog or something like that. Now, if you do a deploy during that time or your beam crashes for whatever reason or you tear down your docking containers, now you lost all that stuff. And that can sometimes be a real problem. Um, and the, the point of, uh, so where I originally came from is that the beam was not really, des- the beam doesn't give you anything to solve that problem because it, it made an assumption about the process is living a long time. Um, so... I figured that it, it really makes sense to store that job state um, somewhere outside of the beam so that if you do deploy or something like that, you, you can guarantee to execute those jobs even if you lose your, your state. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Like, feel free to jump in with any questions or anything like that. If, if oh, I yeah, make, it makes total sense. I have, a, I have a bad history of just kind of ignoring that whole what happens if we redeploy in the middle of one of these problem. Well, we but, were actually running into this problem at work. Um, mostly because some of our tasks take, uh, take some time to execute. Um, and the longer the, obviously the longer the task takes, um, the more likely it is that you're going to run into the problem of a deploy. And quite aside from that, there's the other aspect of what if your task fails? So let's say you have a sign-up flow, and this is a, a not completely accurate example, but we have had something like this happen to us. And the user makes a typo in their telephone number or something like that, right? Um, or they put, or, you know, you ask for a telephone number and they've actually put in two numbers with a space between them or something like that. 
So now you have a job that goes and posts that to your CRM, except the CRM rejects it because it says that's not a valid phone number. So now you've got a failed job. That job failed. So maybe, you, maybe if you're using an in-memory, you know, if you just spin off a task or something, you've lost all the information about what you were trying to do in the first place. So trying to retry that thing is actually not trivial to do. Um, and it's, if you, you could keep that in a, in a gen server in a state, um, but then, you know, you certainly might, it's certainly quite likely that you might do a deploy and lose that before you had a chance to actually look at what went wrong and retry that job. And we were running into that problem. Yeah, that is an interesting uh, situation because like with the Beam and Elixir, you have this idea of supervisors. And mm -hmm. the idea that, like you were talking about earlier, that uh, it was designed to be up and running for a long period of time. And so you do have that situation where uh, you, and the kind of the philosophy of let it crash that kind of exists in the, the Erlang kind of community. And kind of what that's saying is, I can't worry about all the things that could go wrong. Like the user might put in two phone numbers with a space. I can't, I can't worry about all the ways that this could crash. I know at some point it will crash. And I have to think more about how do I recover and get back mm -hmm. to a good state. And so I think that's really what you're talking about here is like, I want a way so that I have something that's recoverable. I can get back to a good state. Is that right? Uh, something, something like that. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's related to that. So I think what we want to do is if, if we have a job that fails, we want to know what we were trying to do and um, why it failed and what we have to do in order to, to, to retry that thing. So one of, the, one of the ideas I came up with to help, because it is confusing if you say, uh, you know, in, in Erlang, we already have tasks and things. And you say, well, which, you know, what do I, how, which solution do I need to execute this task? So one of the concepts I sort of thought about was, well, you can actually split your tasks up into tasks that are either best effort or guaranteed execution. So a lot of, a lot of tasks don't require this kind of level of, um, they don't require setting state outside of the beam. You know, if you want to, if you, not all of them need to be able to be retried. So, I mean, one example in R uh, that we have at Nested where I work is uh, as part of a user's onboarding flow, um, they put in the address of their house because we're a real estate agent. So, um, you know, we need, we need their address as part of the sign up process. So they put in the address of their house and they go through the flow. And then later on, we want to show them a nice map that has the, uh, the property geolocated on the map. So it shows them their, their property with a uh, the right location on the map. So we need a latitude and longitude for that. Well, we've got to go away to uh, an external API and query for that latitude and longitude. Um, and we don't want to make the user, we want to let the user keep going through the form while we're doing that. So that's an asynchronous task. But if that task fails, it's not actually useful to be able to retry that hours or days later because the user is long gone. Um, you know, the page we have, the web page we have that shows the geolocated property is able to cope with a, with an no latitude and longitude anyway, because sometimes you just can't get it. So that's a best effort task. You know, it, if you lose it, it's, it's, it's a, in the very rare case, it's really not the end of the world. It doesn't take very long. So for that thing, like regular tasks are just fine. One of the questions I ended up asking myself when I was building this thing is, okay, so we want to make, if, we have, if that's a best effort task, we also have tasks that we need to guarantee execution of. And these are essentially the way that you want to classify the, these things is, is the company going to lose money if this thing doesn't happen? You know, like, is this really mission critical? Um, and in our case, d there were certain actions we needed to take with regards to putting the customer in, this, in our CRM and certain uh, notifications that we need to send and events that have to happen on a sign up that really were mission critical because customers can be worth quite a lot of money to us if they're selling their house with us. So we don't want to miss anybody. So for those kind of tasks, you want to put them in the guaranteed execution bucket. Like you want them to be retriable and you want to know if they failed and why, and you want to have an easy way to be able to try them again. Yeah, I mean, that, that, makes, that makes total sense. So yes, uh, I've had plenty of, plenty of applications where I absolutely need a guaranteed execution. So far, I've been kind of okay with, with best effort on most of the things, at least the parts that I worked on in Elixir. Well, Elixir actually has a lot of, uh, quite a lot of libraries for doing this sort of thing. So there's um, XQ, which is probably the most famous one, um, certainly got the most stars on GitHub uh, for whatever, whatever that's worth. Um, and that's hook that uses the same format as rescue, uh, and sidekick, I think they share the same format. So it uses Redis, um, and it uses JSON to serialize the arguments. Um, and it actually, one of the cool features about XQ is that it's, you can take a Ruby queue 
and you can, um, so you might have an existing legacy Ruby application that has a, a large amount of jobs that it's processing and you can write an Elixir consumer for those jobs. So you can move your jobs onto an Elixir cluster if, if you need more performance or more scalability or something like that. I think that's a really good use case for, for execute. That's, that's one of the really great things about it, that it's compatible. Um, and there's a, there's a few other options there as well. Um, and I looked into a lot of them and I wasn't really happy with any of them. None of the options I found quite suited my needs. So XQ is really great because it builds off that robust base. Sidekick and Rescue have been in production for years and Ruby applications, a lot of people are happy with them. Um, but there are a couple of issues with it. So um, number one, it brings in a Redis requirement. Now I'm, I'm quite a, opinionated about this. I actually think that Redis is completely redundant if you're using Elixir. I, I can't, I don't really know what it's for. I, I mean, I, what I think it's for is for shoring up the gaps in clustering and inter-process communication that you have with like a Node.js or a Ruby app. Um, but I, it, since Elixir has clustering built in, I, I don't really, I think a lot of what Redis brings is not actually that necessary. Um, and I wanted to see if I could do this without bringing an external dependency. Um, yeah. It is necessary yes. if you're hosting on a platform such as uh, Heroku, um, because oh, they they uh, don't yeah cluster yeah exactly exactly. So then, if you wanted to uh, do pub sub or something like that, you'd have to go through Redis. You'd have to go through some sort of external, uh, yeah, some sort of external thing or something like like Rescue, where it is just internal only. Yeah. Uh, not re what I'm saying is like, from what I understand on 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 your library, on the Rihanna library, something like that probably would work, but it would still require. Well, I don't know. So let me ask you that real quick. I, mm -hmm. I totally like injected myself in in your thought process, and no, I no, apologize. Please, <clears throat> Currently, I have a I have a, a a company called Code Fund, and we do uh we do funding for open source through ethical advertising, and we we built it in Elixir, and currently it's being hosted on on Heroku, and we use Redis because we cannot with uh, we cannot reliably fire off uh, side processes. So would this solve that issue? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I've, I've realized that I haven't actually, haven't really described the solution that I came up with. Essentially, um, it's called Rihanna. So it's a, it's a database back job queue. So it's just like Rescue, except it uses the database. Um, conceptually, it's similar to delayed job in Ruby, um, right. which is a very popular one. But delayed job has a lot of performance problems because of its implementation. So a lot of people will be burned by that. Um, so Rihanna uses, I'm not going to get too much into the technical details of it now, um, but it uses advisory locks to be able to use the database as a job queue, but it's very fast and it doesn't put a lot of load on the database. And the, the cool thing about this, there's a couple of cool things about this. So one, you don't need, I mean, if you didn't need Redis anyway, like you don't need to install it for this, like almost all, pragmatically speaking, almost all Elixir deployments are something like a Phoenix app with a database. Like almost all of them have a database already. So you don't need to bring in any external dependencies. You know, you don't need to pay any more for another Heroku Dino to run Redis or whatever it is. You can just use the database you already have. Um, and another cool thing is it uses something called external term format, which is something built into Erlang that allows you to essentially serialize any arbitrary Erlang term to a binary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's really useful because it allows you to pass in structs or tuples or whatever you want as your arguments to your, your jobs that you want to execute. Um, one of the annoying things about execute is it's not really a drop-in replacement for synchronous tasks. You can't just take a function call and uh, make it asynchronous and run via execute because it has to be serialized to, uh, serializable to JSON. Oh. And quite a lot of things in Elixir are not serializable to JSON out of the box, like structs, for example. So that's quite irritating because now you have to change how you're writing your code because of the idiosyncrasies of your job queuing system. And I wasn't very happy about that. I wanted to write Elixir how I wanted my Elixir to look and have the job queuing system just handle that. I love it. So you mentioned on here that it was inspired, uh, heavily inspired by Q. Yeah. But from what I'm looking at, it does, what, what did Q bring to this that was not brought by Redis and, and I'm sorry, Sidekick and Rescue and Delay Job? Q is um, an implementation of a job queuing system like the other ones you listed, but it runs on a database. And the way that it queries for jobs is uh, considerably more efficient than how Delay Job does it. 
So that's that's the the real takeaway that I took from Q is essentially that, that it's got a SQL query in there that um, queries. So to take a step back here, when you have a job queuing system, you have a distributed one. You have multiple nodes, and each node has to read from a table of jobs. But it needs to know, okay, so I'm going to read from this table of jobs, but I only want to take the jobs that aren't currently being executed by something else. So it needs to know that you have to have some way of putting that information in the database about right. which node is executing which jobs, and you use a lock for that. So the right. way that delayed job works is it uses row locking. And this is bad because when you lock a row in a database, if one node locks the row, when another row tries to read from that table to get the jobs, it will block and wait until that row is, is gone. And so essentially that means your performance is terrible um, and you don't get much benefit from adding more nodes to it. So um, Q uses quite a clever query which has advisory locks in it. So um, what it essentially means is it'll just, it'll just skip over the rows that are already locked. And advisory locks are very lightweight, so it's quite fast um, with how that works. How long has this library been out? Uh, I released it about three months ago, maybe a bit less, actually. And are you well, using you. it in production already? Yeah, yeah, we're using it in production yeah, here. I figured. Great. Um, it's got a uh, UI as well. That's another thing I wanted that a lot of job queuing libraries didn't have. Um, what, what I want as a developer, right, is this, or even not as a developer, because we have like a, we have platform engineers here um, that see failed jobs. Now, it's not reasonable to expect them to know how to shell in, connect to our, uh, one of our production nodes and run command line tasks or run commands in the IEX shell on production to be able to retry a job. That's not reasonable. Um, what they want to be able to do is say, okay, look, th I can see this job failed. I can see why it failed. I can see what it was trying to do. Um, I can see that it failed because this value in the database was wrong. So now I can go fix it in the database and I can just want to click a button and retry that job. And honestly, as a developer, that's what I want as well. I don't want to be shelling into you know, trying to write commands and dig the right job out. I want to see a, I want to see a list of things. Like I, I want to, like a pretty list and I want to be able to see what failed. I want to be able to retry it or delete it there. Um, so like part of, part of why I did it as well because was a bit of frustration because I couldn't find any, like I couldn't find any database backed queues that both had decent performance and um, had a UI that I, could, that I could just retry jobs easily in. Why did you call it Rihanna. Oh, it says in the it says in the readme there um, because she knows how to work, 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 work. That's why. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I see it is right there at the bottom. Yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> what about? Uh, so I, I, I'm fascinated by this by this um, library here because it's something that I've been looking for. One of the requirements that I've always had has been doing uh, rate limiters. Yeah. Uh, have you have you had to work with that before? Or is there plans, or does it already do that? If not, are there plans to add that feature? So, what uh, could you describe in a bit depth what what a rate limiter does? So, for just as an example, let's say you're hitting the Amazon API, and in the Amazon API, you can only hit their API x number of times per second and x mm. number of times per minute. So, or let's say you're hitting the Twilio API, and you don't want to send a thousand text messages at one immediate point, you actually want to space it out and make sure that they don't send but every three seconds mm, or we're going to get an like error. So we're talking about job throttling here. Job throttling. Yes. Interesting. It's a complicated problem to solve. And I think that's why, um, that's why the sidekick library uh, only includes that in the enterprise version. Um, but it is something that, uh, that would be, tremendously impactful i don't want to like push in a direction or anything but man you should do this <laughs> yeah listen man it's, um, i'm totally open to feature requests like for for us at uh, nested right now this library is doing exactly what we need it to do cool but, um i i built it because i saw like that there's a gap in the elixir ecosystem for something like this and i'm really keen to, to build it into something that a lot of people want to use so if you think this is a this is a useful feature um, please go ahead and open an issue on the GitHub page. Um, okay, yeah, I will. If you, if you detail what you want, I'm I'm happy to look at that. Well, I can definitely link to an example of it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, well, thanks. Go ahead no, and that's that's page, great. And I'll tell it to anyone that's listening that um, wants a feature that's not in there. Um, I'm, I try to be very responsive on there. Um, go onto the GitHub page for Rihanna, uh, open an issue, talk about what it is that you want. 
um, and we can see about uh, how difficult an implementation might be. That's right. Make Sam work for you, folks. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's talk briefly about the open source side of what you got going on. What? Uh, so you you work for a company, and there's mm. there apparently is a uh, a mentality, or uh, the company is saying, okay, hey. Yes, you can open source this library, or was that always the intent, or did you just kind of do it and say, "Hey, I did this"? What what um, led this to become open source? A bit of all three, really. So at Nested, like I joined pretty early on in the company stages. I think we were only we were only about four or five engineers when I joined, and everyone, like especially um, our CTO, is very much into like. Uh, he really sees the benefits of open source. 99% of what we build is built on top of the hard work that other people have done. Um, you know, we didn't come up with Elixir. We didn't come up with right. we didn't write Absinthe, our GraphQL library, all this stuff. Um, so I don't think there was ever any question about open, like everyone here has been very enthusiastic about open sourcing anything we can that's going to contribute, like, give something back to the community. And um so when I, when I set out to write this, really, like, uh, it was scratching our own itch. It was solving a problem that we had. But, I, you know, I thought, well, we're not that uncommon. Like, there must be other people that also want to do something like this. So it just, I don't know, it just seemed like a no-brainer. Mm. Plus, you know, eventually, if you open source something, I suppose the, the idea is that you get people, you get other people involved, you get more eyes on it. Um, eventually, you might get other people contribute to it. And then you can sort of, you know, you can, um, you can even benefit from other people helping you out with your, with, with your work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually recently gave a talk at, at a conference about, uh, about that topic of, of open source sustainability and the reasons why people do get into open source. I'm always fascinated to talk to people like you who are, you know, an active contributor to the, to the ecosystem and, and find out your motivation behind it and what led you to it. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's another thing, which is, I think that, um, when you're, when you're building a small engineering team at a larger, at some point you come to a bit of a crossroads in how you want to do things philosophically. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, there is, there's two choices here, and both of them are valid, um, where you can choose to say, okay, we want to we wanna build on the work of others all the time, and we're going to make sure that we use things that are battle-tested. And even if they're not quite exactly what we need, you know, let's, um, let's leverage uh, existing libraries um, for everything. And that's a bit of a safer option, but that's not really quite the culture that I wanted to develop here at Nested. I sort of wanted to wanted us to become more like uh, a bit bolder, a bit more, you know, try to, I think we have the potential to be more like thought leaders here at the, at the company in, in what, what Elixir is doing. So to that extent, sometimes you have to take a few risks and, you know, if you have a, if you have a real need and nothing else is quite right, maybe maybe that's a community need as well and if you can write something that's gonna that's gonna work for that then you know you should so i think that's sort of where i was coming from with it nice i have a question regarding some of the implementation here one of the things that i'm not quite clear on is what is an advisory lock yeah cool um great question so my sequel has these as well um but essentially, it's a very lightweight lock that the database gives you that has absolutely nothing to do with any rows or even, indeed, anything to do with the schema of the database. It's um, essentially a semaphore. So it's, in Postgres, it's an integer, a 64-bit integer, and any session, which is an open connection, can take a lock on that integer. And then any, only one session can hold the lock at any one time, and any other session that tries to take the lock will um, be denied. So it will say, yeah, you can't take the lock. Um, and it's essentially a way of using Postgres as a coordination point for a distributed system. So it's called an advisory lock because the database doesn't enforce anything based on that lock. If you have row locking or table locking, the database will actually enforce that, for example, if you lock a row for update, the database will enforce that nothing else can modify that row until the lock is released. Well, advisory lock doesn't relate to any rows. It's just a way of saying of, for one node in your distributed system to advise to the rest of the nodes, um, okay, guys, I've got this lock for whatever application specific meaning that that has. Um, and in Rihanna, the application specific meaning is, okay, this lock has the integer of one. So that means that the job with ID one is locked. And I know that that's what it means. So I'm going to skip that and look for a, another one that I can take on and execute. That makes sense. So it doesn't force people to not, how do I put it? Yeah. So, so there's no enforcement, you know, somebody else can go look at 
job number one and start executing it if they really, really want to. But this is me saying, hey, I've got this one, folks. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So how do you allow things to say time out then or something? You know, let's say that. Uh, so this, this is the. I go, I go the, kill my Docker container like you were talking yeah, yeah. about before. It, it all works itself out in the end, right? Because if you take uh, advisory locks are only alive for the length of the session. And a session is essentially a database connection. So if you have a node and it takes an advisory lock on a job and it's now executing that job, while it's got the connection open, that advisory lock is taken. Um, however, if that node dies, you unplug the Docker container, whatever, that connection dies with it. Postgres sees that, it goes, okay, that session is gone, releasing the advisory lock now. So what you end up with is now something else can say, okay, now I can take a lock on that job and execute it. So the worst case scenario is um, that you execute a job more than once. Because what you might have is um, in a distributed system, you have a node take an advisory lock, and then it loses, a, let's say you get a latency spike or something like that. So it loses its connection to the database. Now that node is going to continue to execute the job but the advisory lock has been released because the, the mm -hmm. connection was broken. So now another node can take that. So worst case scenario is you get more than one execution. But it's a curious property of distributed systems that it's actually impossible to guarantee exactly once execution. You can, you can make uh, different levels of guarantees. So you can say, I'm going to execute this thing at most once, or I'm going to execute this thing at least once. But it's sort of a mathematical impossibility to execute it exactly once. So if you're assuming then at least once, then you need to write your code such that if it runs twice, it's not going to mess stuff up. Ideally, yes. So this is okay if you're, for a lot of jobs, this is okay. So this is called being idempotent, which means if I execute the thing multiple times, it's not going to, it's going to end up with the same end result. Um, this is not always possible. So some jobs like sending an email are intrinsically, you can't write them like that. Um, so there's always the risk that you might, you know, in a rare occasion sent to. So the failure modes of Rihanna are um, you lose a connection to the database, like I described earlier. And I think there's one other um, possible failure mode, which I can't remember. It's on the README. I wrote a, I wrote a FAQ on the README, which describes this. Um, but they're both pretty rare. So it should be unusual in production that you would see this issue. So when you went to Nested, uh, you kind of brought the whole Elixir, uh, you, you kind of came in and shook things up, right? And said, okay, we're, let's, here's Elixir. Tell us about that experience and how did you get them to actually start thinking, uh, get away from the mentality of Ruby development into the more functional Elixir type development? What was your experience with that? Yeah, great question, man. Yeah, when I, Nested is a, maybe it might help if I actually describe what Nested is because I don't think I've done that yet. Um, so Nested is a real estate company that is, Basically, in the UK, buying and selling property is an incredibly broken process. It's very long and drawn out, and there's a lot of nonsense that has to happen to make that work. Um, so what we're trying to do is essentially leverage technology to try to make that whole process a lot smoother and a lot um, better experience for people that are buying and selling homes. Um, so when I, for that reason, like Nested is sort of kind of at its foundation a technology company. So there was, even when I joined, there was definitely um, the culture of being willing to try out new things. Now, when I did join, they had, uh, they had a legacy, well, we had a legacy um, Rails app or a couple of legacy Rails apps that were serving our website and everything like that. Um, and the plan was to migrate to a React front end and a back end using GraphQL. <clears throat> um, when I started the first week, I played around with the Ruby GraphQL uh, back end and there was a library we were using and I just really wasn't happy with it. So um, I sort of just thought, well, maybe I could, you know, I'd, I'd already been into Elixir for a few months and done a few pet projects in it. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe it's not too hard. Like we've only just started writing this GraphQL server. So maybe we can just rewrite this in Elixir. And um, so I just sort of took a day and wrote it on the sly. And uh, it only took me about a day and I had something up and running. So I, you know, I, I said to the, um, I said to the guys, look, you know, we should just, maybe we could just try this. Um, and everybody was on board with the idea. So we ended up just replacing our fledgling Ruby graph cursor with an Elixir one. Um, and I just sort of sneaked it in early and then uh, now we're stuck with it. Um, but it's definitely That's a pretty fantastic cool. experience. Like uh, it's, a, we've had a lot of good things come out of it. It's a really good technology decision. So what, what made, what, uh, in, in, we ask everybody to fill out some show notes. And one of the things that you filled out in there, which 
caused me to kind of want to prod and, and get to the answer of this is you said that Ruby didn't scale for you. Mm-hmm. What parts of Ruby didn't scale? Like, can you address the so, biggest pain point that you had to move? It was it GraphQL. Is that the reason? Is that the point that it didn't scale? No, um, that's not the point. And scalability is not the only issue. Um, so actually my original pain from this came back a couple of years back when I was working at a company called factual. Now they're based in, um, the U S and I was working as a rails engineer, um, on their customer facing rails apps. And we had, we have an API that is exposed to a lot of devices. Like we, you know, hundreds of thousands of, uh, millions of devices. And obviously rails was just not able to cope with that load. So we ended up implementing a Node.js um, backend to handle that. Um, and working with JavaScript was a whole different world of hurt, which, um, like, you know, it scaled better than Ruby, but, um, you know, there were, the developer experience was terrible. So, you know, coming from that, I thought, well, that maybe there's something else out there that I can get the developer experience of Ruby. Well, it's, it's not so much about scaling as much as not ever having to worry about scalability. With Ruby, you really, you have to worry about that. Um, you know, it's nice to start out a project, but there's always this thing in the back of your mind, well, one day, one day, maybe we're going to be Twitter and, you know, now we've got problems. Um, and with Elixir, you just never have to make that trade-off. So it's, uh, it's, it's great. There's a couple of other things about it. And I, I want to stress that actually probably the primary reason for me using Elixir is actually not about the scalability. Um, one of those things is immutable data. This is like a really, really key part of what made it great. And I, I really used to be into Clojure as well for the same reason. Um, immutable data is a game changer. Um, I think Rich Hickey said this. He said, because uh, Rich Hickey was a, you guys know Rich Hickey, right? He's the inventor of Clojure. So yep. he talks about his experience programming C++, and he was like a C++ programmer for like 10 years or something. Um, so he was a wizard at C++. And he said, when he started, you know, using a language with immutable data, it was like someone had been treading on his foot that whole time, and finally they stopped doing it. And he, he was like, oh, I don't have to worry but that this stuff might be changed while I'm not looking. You know, like I can rely that that thing is going to be that thing and it's always going to be the same. Um, and somehow out of this it comes the combination of um, using immutable data with a lot of functions over, uh, you know, over classes with immutable state um, is you just end up getting better code out of it. You end up getting certainly much more maintainable code. Um, when I was working with Ruby, I used to see pull requests fairly often on legacy code bases that we're just refactoring. We're like, okay, so, you know, we've got it. This is a step in the direction that we want to go. We're going to refactor all this stuff. I just, I never see it with Elixir. It's so easy to refactor it because it doesn't, you don't have to worry about all the state change and things like that, um, that you just do the refactoring as part of the feature work. And it's, you never see refactoring PRs. It's this, this crazy thing. Um, one of the other things I really like about it is the um, pattern matching. It makes for really elegant code. It's very easy to reason about. Um, and it makes everything very explicit. So you can be in a function and you can look at the function head and you can say, okay, I know exactly what is in here. I know that it's there and I can make that assumption and move on with my life. And you don't have to sort of always have in the back of your head, okay, maybe it's this other thing and I have to deal with that case. Um, and it just ends up, the code just ends up coming out cleaner, um, easier to reason about, easier to maintain. And um, we've been working on the same code base for a year. Our team has grown to like from five to about 20 engineers. and we've had absolutely no issues scaling the code base. It's been really good. Yeah, I totally agree on pattern matching. Um, it's an incredible feature. Like it's not uh, tr- you know, purely unique to Elixir. Uh, it uh, exists in other functional languages to different degrees. But yes, I, I totally love how pattern matching just defines, you're kind of saying this function, it takes this shape of data going in and that's the happy path. Mm-hmm. And once it comes in, I know exactly what I have and I can process it. And if it doesn't match this pattern, it doesn't go into this function body. So you have these where, you know, previously you might have like this, uh, you know, like Ruby code or have this large uh, object with all these nested structures like a JSON hash or something like that. And it comes in and I have to like test all these different levels of is this value set to true and dig down a little deeper? Is this value set to false and like figuring out what you have? Yeah. You're just having to programmatically uh, explore the shape of the data. And with pattern matching, you're just defining, this is the shape of the data that I accept in this function. And that that's what I let in. 
yeah, that's such a good point because um, it's really making it's it communicates the intent of the programmer so much more clearly when you can see it as a pattern rather than writing the code to test if it's there. So a somewhat tangential question: Have you uh, have you played much with Dialyzer? Or done a whole lot of sort of we specking of the code. Yeah. Yes, awesome. um, we have it in our uh, continuous integration pipeline. So if Dialyzer raises any error, that's a, a build fail. Yeah. And we use specs fairly, I'd say we use them pretty heavily. Dialyzer's got okay type inference, but the specs definitely help it a lot. Um, and it's, it's caught a couple of errors that definitely would have caused production bugs. So I'd say it's been worth it. The only thing I will say about Dialyzer is if you do use it in CI, you have to get the caching right. Because otherwise, it takes so long, you just want to stab yourself in the eye with a fork waiting for the fucking thing. 30-minute so, runs. Yeah. yeah. Well, so yeah, make you sure you get the caching right. Yeah, you have to rebuild the PLT every time. Mm -hmm. So you have to cache that outside of your Docker container. Yeah. Totally yeah, agree. it actually caught three production bugs we hadn't seen yet, and now we never will last week. So. Mm -hmm. isn't, that always such a great, isn't that always such a great feeling? Yep. So one of my pet peeves actually about the library ecosystem in Elixir is that a lot of people write type specs and they obviously don't run Dialyzer because when you use their library, like their type spec is wrong. They've just defined a wrong type spec for what their function does. And then Dialyzer comes up with an error. So actually quite a few of our pull requests coming out of Nested have been to third party libraries we're using, which have wrong specs because they've written a type spec, but not actually ever run Dialyzer on it. And then sort of our thing is flagged that. I'm actually actually suffering right now because we use an undocumented feature of uh, Erlang port open in, in something, and uh, it's not spec either in Erlang or Elixir that you can use it that way. Oh, so yeah. Dialyzer thinks we're wrong. There and, is a thing you can add called a dot .dialyzer dash ignore warnings. Yep. With, you can just add lines in there. Um, but I, you know, I, try to, I try to make, you know, it's better to fix the third-party library than just ignore the warnings. Star star slash star dot ex fixed. <laughs> <laughs> It's terrible. I think, you know, it's we, one of those things that I think is quite nice for, um, especially junior programmers, I think. Um, there's this tendency to think that all open source libraries are created by these sort of mystical wizards that live in the high castle of um, open source. And, you know, you can't look inside the internals and you can't, you know, it's a big barrier to get to contribute. And, you know, it really isn't because all these libraries are written by regular people. Um, and I think, you know, it's really nice for junior developers, especially to sort of break that barrier and say, no, look, you can look under the hood in this library. Um, you know, this guy's human. He makes mistakes just the same and you can get involved. You can open a pull request to his um, repo. You know, this is a small fix that you can make that makes things better for everybody. And this is, you know, you can contribute like this. And I think to a lot of people, this is quite a big hurdle to get over to sort of realize that these things, you know, this is every, all these developers that create these libraries are just human beings as well. And you're, you can get involved just as much as them. Not only getting involved, so the, uh, talking about getting involved in open source, one of the starting points where people can get involved is uh, simply documentation and making sure the documentation is up to date. People tend to be afraid of committing to open source a little bit because they're not sure if their contributions are valuable enough. And documentation. If you have concerns on, on, on doing that, that's a great place to start. Um, I don't know the first, I'm like really starting to learn Phoenix and Elixir and I'm so new to the game. I'm just, I'm, I'm a baby in the world, but I ran into a very specific issue in hosting on um, Heroku mm -hmm. and their documentation didn't give the full story in the Phoenix library. So what I did is I cloned it. I added a section of documentation that was for my use case and I submitted it. And then now I'm a contributor to the Phoenix framework, which to me, that makes me feel like, wow, you know, even though it's a tiny little contribution, I probably helped several, you know, like several people who are, who are using Heroku for Phoenix solve that issue. But another thing is, it's, it's the feeling that you're a part of a community, part of building something that's bigger than yourself, part of building something that is going to be around for a very long time, as long as people keep participating. So I recommend if, yeah, if you can't contribute to the code itself, contribute to the documentation. I think that's one of the things that uh, Jose Valim does really well. And one of the things he got right with Elixir from the start is really encouraging the community to get involved, really encouraging contributions. So one of my first, actually, you know, I'd only been running Elixir for a couple of months and I thought, okay, I want to really get involved with this. So I went onto the Elixir um, 
Git repo and I sort of I looked at the issues, the open issues, and they're, they're pretty good. They, they usually only have a few open on there. Um, and I found one that said level advanced and uh, was like a thing that they wanted to do for Elixir 1.5. So I clicked that and it's like add the, um, it's called the, the at impl directive. So essentially when you implement a behavior, you can add a notation on your functions as at impl true. And then the compiler will check that you really have implemented uh, a function from that behavior. So this is a feature that Jose wanted um, and he'd opened it an issue on there. So I looked at that and I thought, well, how hard can it be? <laughs> so <laughs> little did I know. Um, so I dived, last this, words. <laughs> I dived into this as one of my first, um, as one of my first really big bits of Elixir that I've written. I thought, oh, I'll just get the compiler to make this thing work. It won't be that difficult. Um, and it took me about a month of back and forth on the pull request because I opened it and Jose says, no, 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 you've missed this thing and you've done that. And he was very responsive, actually. Um, I was lucky because I picked a feature that he really wanted. So it's quite helpful with it. Um, and eventually, after a bunch of rounds of iteration, he was like, okay, yeah, that's good. So that's going to go in. And uh, now, it's a, now it's a feature of Elixir. Um, and honestly, looking back at it, I had very little idea what I was doing. Um, and I was essentially getting coaching from the guy that invented the language. So um, that just, I think, just goes to show that you don't, you know, you, you can get involved at any level and there, people will be really helpful for you. Yeah, I agree. Um... Jose has been really responsive. Like I've reported some bugs that I've encountered. Um, that we had, uh, you know, specialized logger behavior and we needed it during the migrations and it wasn't working. And so I go on GitHub, I report an issue and he's totally responsive. He's having some questions. We have this back and forth and they fix it in the next version. So I've, been, I've really enjoyed working with uh, Jose and just the, the community in Elixir, I think it, it has brought along a lot of those benefits from the Ruby community, like that just, you know, Matt's is nice, so we are nice kind of ethos that you mentioned before. I, so I've seen that in Elixir as well. Cool. Anything else we want to dive into here before we get to picks? I always ask that and everyone's always quiet. So then I'm like, all right, let's do it. All right, Josh, you want to start us with picks? So the first one is a talk I have to today. Uh, the first one is a talk on efficient data loading in Elixir using the deferrable pattern. And so it's just about uh, building fast resolvers with absinthe uh, that don't do n plus one queries. And the second, I've got to pull up here. Uh, ah, yeah, it's, uh, there's an article that was on Hacker News last week. Uh, event sourcing made simple. And event sourcing is a good thing. Uh, gen servers and, and React uh, or Redux and the like. So, um, yeah, that's a really good one. And I'll, uh, I'll post the link in just a second. Cool, man. Does this, this deferrable pattern, does that use data loader or is that something else? So it, it does use data loader, but he actually introduced a thing called lazy loader, uh, which I believe Ben Wilson's working on it with him. Uh, and I think it might make it into, into the data loader package, but it provides uh, a little bit more laziness for the data loader. Yeah, one of the funny things about the Absinthe project is that they're, the, um, they're amazingly responsive on the Slack. Like Ben Wilson is an absolute hero of support like every single question i've asked him he's responding the same day but their documentation is like very spotty if you like data loader is the thing that they're using and they've deprecated the old thing which is called batch but if you go to the data loader documentation it says nothing in there it says uh yeah to do write some documentation oh yeah it was uh when i when i first used it now granted it's also you know it took me maybe 30 minutes to actually figure out how to get something working but yeah there was a question in the back of my mind like is is this right uh have you anyway. ever, have, did you read the book I, so I, I have, the book is on my list of things to purchase and has been for about a month. So uh, I keep kind of getting by without it. I need to buy it just to, just to support, but so far I haven't, haven't needed it, yeah. but I should get it anyway. So that it's got quite a bit of stuff about data load in the book and it's also got stuff about subscriptions, which the documentation is pretty light on as well. Yeah. They were also pretty easy to get going, but, but yes, the also mm -hmm. under documented a bit. Uh, also I didn't see in the documentation anything about, uh, just how awesome the graphical uh, plug is for doing subscription stuff. Uh, oh yeah, it's pretty good. So way easier than, than using like GraphQL Playground separately to deal with subscriptions. I can't recall exactly why. I just remember thinking, wow, this is amazing. And yeah, uh, this dovetails really nicely with Eric's point. If you can't contribute to the code, it sounds like the docs could use some help. And oh, I'll definitely. tell you, I know plenty of open source folks where if, if you went and fixed the docs for these folks to the level that it sounds like it needs it, you will be their complete, total, and utter hero. Cool. All right, Mark, do you have some picks? Sure. I was going to uh, pick the Erlang library GProc. Um, it is a, it's an extended process dictionary. 
And it is, uh, it's just part of the Erlang community. And I've been using it recently with something I was doing in Elixir. And it is pretty straightforward. Uh, once I found some blog posts that kind of gave better documentation around it, um, the, the Erlang documentation wasn't quite uh, easy enough for me to comprehend what they were doing. Uh, but uh, it was, it's been really helpful. I, I've used it as a, like a, a, live, a, a process dictionary for a local machine, not using it in cluster mode. But uh, it was working great for my purposes, even though we are in a clustered environment. But uh, that was my pick. Nice. Eric, what are your picks? Uh, I got two of them. So the first one is a uh, product that recently went 100% free. It used to be a subscription-based product. Now they're free. It's called CodePilot. And what CodePilot is, it's an uh, electron application that you could run on your desktop that is a search engine for developers. So it'll search GitHub, it'll search Stack Overflow, it'll search all these different places, including your own document, including your own code folders on your own computer. But the, the, the I can't really speak too well for it, but they have some serious machine learning involved to give you the right results. And, and they recently made it free, and also you can add your own, you can add your own uh, endpoints to it. So you can say, well, I want to search dailydrip.com. You can put it in there with, a, with a, uh, a query and it'll return those results as well. So that's one of them. I'm a big fan. Uh, the other thing that I was so kindly reminded as my children were screaming right outside my office door is working from home. I love working from home. It's probably the best choice I've made in my career because it has really uh, allowed me to to spend more quality time with my family. And, and surprisingly, I get a lot more done working from home than I do in offices. It might be because I'm not in five meetings a day. Mm -hmm. So those are my picks. Yeah, I found working from home, um, the one thing I can do to make my day more productive is shut down Slack so no one <laughs> from work can bug me. <laughs> but uh, sometimes you gotta have that channel open, right? Speaking of which, I'm gonna throw out a few picks here. One is I've been using the system called Convo. It's at Convo.com for a while. And it's kind of a mix between a forum and a chat system. And after using it for about six months, I really don't like it. So I switched back to Mattermost, which is a Slack clone. It's open source. It's pretty awesome. So um, I'm actually just going to open up. I've been trying to kind of do the paid Slack thing for a while, and I finally just gave up. So I'm just going to open up... Uh, teams on my Mattermost server because I'm just using the community edition and I'm using, I have a team for my own team, you know, the people that help me put out the shows, but yeah, I'm going to open that up for people for each of the podcasts. So if you're interested in, you know, kind of joining an Elixir based Slack looking chat, you can definitely do that. The Mattermost app, at least for the desktop, you can also add Slack channels too. So if you're using Slack, you can add them both. You can add both uh, server types to your Mattermost app, and then you just have it all in one app, which is what I've been doing. So, um, really, really impressed with it, though. And the reason that I'm doing that is that then I don't have to play all the games of, oh, I have 200 people in this channel, and I want to keep the chat logs. So, anyway, that's kind of what I'm after there. And I'm going to try and rope the other hosts into joining, but I'm not going to make anybody do anything yet. One other thing that I've been doing a lot of is. I've been documenting all the processes for my business for the podcasts. And I'm finding that that really opens up a lot of things and makes things happen in a way that's more consistent and just all around better. It also has started some conversations between myself and the few people that work for me to make the shows come out. And I realized that this has a very direct parallel with uh, software teams. So if there's something that you're all doing in a specific way, and I think we've seen this with like linters that kind of force you down that path. But for some of the other stuff, like how you do commit messages or how you communicate as a team or how you ask for help or how you delegate work, if you can just sit down and actually write out the process, you'll probably find some ways that you can make those more efficient. And it makes it a lot easier to bring new people in and say, look, this is how we do it. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of pick that even though I don't really have a direct thing for that. And then, yeah, the last thing that I'm going to pick, I know people here, it seems like a lot of the folks I'm talking to in Elixir are doing some form of web development. I don't know if it's as, 
as large a part of the community as with the Ruby community, but a lot of people are. And so I just want to remind folks that we have shows on a lot of the JavaScript environment stuff that you're looking for. So we have a JavaScript show, JavaScript Jabber. We also have an Angular show, um, Adventures in Angular, a React show, which seems to be the thing I see that most people using with Elixir. And that's at uh, that's React Roundup. And then we also have Views on Vue for uh, Vue.js. So if you're interested in any of those, we have those going on. I'm also going to start doing um, a daily YouTube show for about five minutes a day, just talking about something in the JavaScript community. Um, I put up the first episode and then um, my dad passed and I just, I couldn't do it. But I'm kind of getting back into the groove and I'm really looking forward to getting that going. So if you saw that video and you're pissed at me for not getting it out, uh, they're coming. But yeah, um, I'm going to do also do that for Ruby and Angular if you're interested in those topics. But anyway, lots going on here, lots of exciting stuff. And, you know, just, you know, with all the things that have been going on lately, I also just want to remind you, look, you know, and, and Eric brought it up, you know, with working from home, you know, spend some time with the people that you care about because you just, you never know um, when they're going to be gone. So anyway, Sam, what are your picks? Uh, yeah, I, so I thought of a couple while you were, talking there um one of them is a video um which is a presentation um aimed at node.js developers um who have heard about elixir and might be interested in it um, and it is it is, is it serves as a pretty good general introduction to elixir but it also really touches on some of the specific points uh pain points that node.js has at scale and um sort of why the different model of how elixir does things is better, and I think it's a really good explanation. Um, I'm just going to post the link in here. One other thing that I'd recommend is also a talk, and this one was at uh, Elixir London conference last year about uh, umbrella applications. Because I hear uh, this is a question I get from devs on our team even sometimes about uh, when is the right time to use an umbrella application? Um, what, which, you know, where should code live? Should it be in its own app in the umbrella or should it be inside another app? Um, how should I structure it? Why, you know, what are the trade-offs of using umbrellas, things like that? Um, this is the best explanation I've seen for what an umbrella is and when and how you should use it. So I'm just going to post the talk there as well. Awesome. Now, one other question I have for you, Sam, is if people want to follow what you're thinking or see what you're working on, I'm assuming you're on GitHub and Twitter. You, I think you said you had a blog too. Can you just remind us what the, those links yeah, are? Yeah, no problem. So I'm at Sam Philip D almost everywhere. So that's on Twitter, on GitHub and that. And my website where I make blog posts is SamuelDavies.net. Awesome. And if people were interested in Nested, either working there or using the tool, how do they find that? Oh, if you're a developer and you want to work with Elixir, uh, just DM me on Twitter. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Um, otherwise, you just go to nested.com. We've got a careers page and all that stuff. Cool. Well, thank you for coming and talking to us. Oh, thank you, man. It's been great. All right. We'll go ahead and wrap this one up, and we will catch everyone next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.